In January 2014, the British government summoned the Israeli ambassador to discuss Tel Aviv's decision to expand its settlements in the occupied Palestinian territories. The Palestinians have long sought an independent state on the occupied lands of the West Bank, East Al-Quds and the besieged Gaza Strip. They want Israel to withdraw from those lands, lands captured during a pattern of military action, occupation and annexation which has involved its neighbours, including the Lebanon, Syria and the Golan Heights. It's hardly surprising then that the continued expansion of Israeli settlements in occupied Palestine has been called a major obstacle to peace in the Middle East. Half a million Israelis already live in 120 settlements built since Israel's occupation in 1967. Even the United Nations regards the settlements as illegal that's because the territories captured in war are subject to the Geneva Convention, which forbids construction on occupied territories. So how much do the public know about what's going on in Palestine? How do they feel about the Israeli settlements and the continued occupation of those lands? What do they think Britain should do in response? These are the simple questions we sought to answer. And we began by asking the public if they knew how Israel had come into existence and whether they felt that process had been fair to the people already living on those lands. Do you know how Israel was created and if so, was it fair to the people who were already living on that land? Okay, so as far as I know, it was actually a group of countries that basically divided up the land to take the um, people who then became the Israelis. And I think it was unfair for the people who were there to start with. Their, their land was divided um, externally. I do know how it came into existence, um, and I think it's a quite difficult question. I, I think it was probably, I think perhaps they could have been done better, but in the overall situation it was done as fairly as it could, as it could possibly be done, considering the whole geographical and political uh, chaos. If I'm not wrong, I think it came into existence after the Second World War. Um, in my opinion, I don't think it was fair. Um, I think my judgment is not, uh, you know, many people have different opinions, but for me, uh, it wasn't fair for the people who were already living there uh, for centuries, and even more than that, if I'm not wrong. Uh, so, yeah, my answer would be not fair. Well, I think it was a long and complicated process, but really it was led by the British. And if there's any fairness or unfairness, I think it's laid on, on, on Britain as the, those who should take the blame for having, through Balfour, through others, having, having constructed an almost insoluble situation. So that's what the public thought. We turned to our experts for a historical perspective on how Israel was actually created and the fairness of that process. Here's what they said. Uh, it came into existence. Uh, through a well-concocted uh, uh, plot uh, that took a number of years to materialize uh, in the United Nations where a number of countries were bribed uh, to accept the partition of Palestine and as a result it was internationally endorsed but moreover it was accompanied by the expulsion of three quarters of the Palestinian people. They were dispossessed and, and evicted from their land and as a result, uh, there is no doubt that this is, you know, this was grossly unfair. Israel came into existence as a result of actions by the British government when they occupied Palestine in 1917 uh, and on a promise to the Zionist Federation uh, undertook to establish a homeland for the Jews. And this involves suppressing the rights of the Palestinian people to self-determination. Uh, suppressing them right the way through from the 1920s, the 1930s when the Palestinians rose up against the British and colluding with uh, the Israelis in establishing the State of Israel uh, in 1948. 
Next, we turn to Israel's actions since it was created as a nation. We asked the public if they were aware of what Israel had done against the Palestinian people in the last 60 years and how they felt about that. Are you aware of the actions of Israel which it has taken against the Palestinians over the last 60 years and how do you feel about those? Well, I feel it almost ironic that um, uh, the people of Israel, many of them have been persecuted, in, in my opinion, seem to do exactly the same thing to the Palestinians, that their, their right to have an education, for example, which is particularly important, is, is almost removed. They have inability to move in and out of their territories that are decided on by the um, Israelis, and the prime areas of land are also being taken for use by Israel as well. So I think it's a very unfair position. Yeah, there's uh, about settlements and the Prime Minister Netanyahu is um, trying to put up settlements on the West Bank that are a lot, you know, that's being contested and there's various other issues of violence in that area against them. What do you think of those actions? Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think they're validated. I don't think it's fair to marginalize a group and gentrify them as well, kick them, kicking them out of where they live. I don't think that's fair. Yeah, I'm aware that they have taken action against Palestinians, and I think it's not fair on, on what they do to um, yeah what they did to the Palestinians. Yeah. If you say actions against the Palestinian people, I would mainly mainly think of the settlements, the illegal settlements, which I believe are illegal and illegitimate. Um, and I believe if there should be any solution that may succeed, then it would be without those settlements and with Israel. Um, with Israel uh, apologizing even for them. It's really a historical question. So we turn to our experts to ask them to give us a brief summary of Israel's actions against the Palestinians over the last 60 years. Well, I, the, the actions taken by Israel against the Palestinian people uh, uh, over the last 60 years, they, they vary, but they, they are in the main uh, uh, illustrated by the policies of, of, of denial, of discrimination, of eviction, persecution. Uh, these are the, the, the realities you know, uh, uh, that have been uh, pursued uh, through law and, and by sheer military force. Uh, the Israelis have been suppressing the rights of the Palestinians for the last 60 years. In, indeed, going back before that, um, members of the terrorist paramilitary organizations of the Zionist uh, Federation were involved in helping the British suppress the Palestinians in the 1936-39 uprising uh, against Britain. Uh, they uh, played a part in doing that and in uh, the lead up to 1948 were involved in terrorizing Palestinians and of course in 1947-48 in particular were responsible for driving 750,000 Palestinians off their lands and denying them their rights. In 1967, again, uh, further uh, actions by the Israelis led to the displacement of Palestinians, uh, the theft of their lands, the theft of their property, their homes, their businesses, and of course, denying them the right uh, to establish a Palestinian state as they should have. In 2008, Israel subjected Palestine to bombardment and used the very harmful white phosphorus in civilian areas. They're reported to have killed 1,400 people, many of them children. We asked the public what they felt should be done, if anything, about those actions. Well, you would really hope that you know the United Nations or some other body would step in in, in all, all situations like this where there is a you know, a community or a population being subjected to external force. But I think rather unfortunately, it almost seems that the choice of intervention depends on how much wealth is in that, that country. So without oil or other, other reserves, those countries tend to be ignored. So I think it's, a, again, a, a failure of the international community. I mean, it's tempting to, to retaliate, but obviously that's not the best thing to do. I really don't know. I think that... I mean, it's so easy to say to in, in, engage in, in discussions and get other countries involved and get the UN involved, but that doesn't seem to be working, so I, I really don't know what the solution would be. Um, I, I really don't know, and I don't think anyone does, to be honest, because everything that's been tried hasn't worked either. I think that action should be taken to the United Nations. It should have gone through full investigations, and it should have, the appropriate people should have been put to justice. 
But un unfortunately, with these kind of situations, the way the international community is structured, there's a certain bias towards Israel from certain members. And I don't think that there should be any favoritism. People who are culpable should be brought to justice. But at the same time, it shouldn't all be unfair towards Israel. They, uh, you should have fair public scrutiny to what's happened because Israel may actually be completely uh, free of any, uh, not guilty of anything that's happened. But they just need to have that open debate, which I don't think has happened because there's too much partisanship, there's too much uh, uh, political motives behind it. Of course Israel should be subjected to the same law as anyone else. But that is the question. They should be subjected to the same law as everyone else. And I'm not sure Israel always is. Sometimes, in fact, it's the scapegoat as well as someone that's left alone. Sometimes it is the international scapegoat of uh, a consensus on the uh, left of politics, of which I consider myself. We put the same question to our experts and asked them what they felt should be done about this kind of bombardment. We killed wantonly, discriminately, indiscriminately, more than 1,000 civilians. Uh, that in, in itself constituted you know, a, a, a war crime because the Gaza Strip, as we know, is, 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 is under occupation uh, as you know, uh, defined by international law. Israel continues to, uh, to uh, maintain a siege on the territory and prosecuted this war in 2008 in order to uh, depose the elected government uh, of the territory. All of this uh, 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 unmask the true reality of, of what Israel is about, and it is high time the international community uh, takes action against uh, you know, this rogue state that continues to operate above international law and standards. I think people should remember that 1,440 Palestinians were killed during that action by the Israelis, including 440 children. Uh, the Israelis used all kinds of uh, military equipment and also used uh, phosphorus bombs. For that, they should have been put on, uh, on trial. They should have been uh, brought before the International Court of Justice for war crimes, which is what I think that was. Uh, I think as a result of that, uh, governments should have refused to uh, trade with them over arms and uh, not participate, uh, not uh, engage in any forms of trade with them with, with armaments. Um, instead of which, of course, since uh, the uh, 2006 onwards, uh, we've seen a siege of Gaza taking place and a blockade of Gaza taking place against the Palestinians. Uh, quite the reverse should have happened. We moved on to a more personal question. We asked the public how they would feel if thousands of settlers were moved into their neighbourhood and effectively allowed to claim their land. Here's what they said. How would you respond if thousands of people were settled into your neighbourhood and claimed your land, as has happened in Israel? I think obviously, like, if it was happening to my land, obviously you would react. At the same time, I think people have to interact first and communicate and maybe they could even live there if it doesn't make uh, any problem on my land. So I think communication is the best uh, solution. If 100,000 people were settled in my land, I would be slightly confused uh, because my land is London and currently not claimed by anyone. Uh, I'd probably ask why they're being settled here and then if we're drawing a parallel to the Israel-Palestine situation, I would be slightly upset. Yeah, I'm totally against gentrification, especially when um, there's no, um, there's no, uh, what's it called, entitling the people to something new. So you, you chase them out and you don't um, give them anything in return. You make them fend for your, themselves. So I'm not in support of that at all. But personally, I would try to have uh, take legal action and would hope that the state where I live in supports me in doing that. If that was not the case, I think I might be tempted to leave to move somewhere else if I feel unprotected. We put the same question to our experts and asked them what they felt were the motivations in response to the vast settlement of people into an area and that those people were allowed to, in effect, take control of the existing residents' land. There, there, there is a hue and cry about the, you know, the immigrants coming from Eastern Europe, particularly the Romanians. They are coming 
legally <laughs> through laws which are upheld by the European Union of which Britain is a part, let alone if they were to come illegally. Uh, what is happening if we compare this to Palestine? It's a marked difference in Palestine, the occupation of the West Bank and Gaza and Jerusalem is illegal. They have, it, it's not their land. It, in fact, they throw the people off their land. They throw them out of their homes. They take their possessions and then settle in it. No people in the world will accept you know, such uh, demeaning uh, treatment from another. Well, I think it's a question that doesn't really need to be asked. If there was any attempt, uh, for example, you could use the case of the uh, Second World War, 1939-1945, when Britain armed and uh, was prepared to defend itself against uh, the occupation of the country uh, or attempted occupation of the country by uh, Germany. And of course in France, uh, people uh, where it was occupied, people conducted resistance and uh, took up arms to fight against that occupation. I think that's a right that the Palestinian people have. They have a right to defend themselves, they have a right to uh, to uh, struggle uh, for self-determination uh, and I, I think that is a right that should be recognised internationally. Many criticise Israel's continued expansion of the settlements and claim that anti-Palestinian policies and even some human rights abuses are obstructing the peace process. Should the public agree? And if so, what should be done? Many have criticised Israel's continued expansion of settlements on Palestinian land and say that anti-Palestinian policies and human rights abuses are obstructing peace. Do you agree and if so, what should be done? Wow, okay, so <laughs> I think anything, that sort of, anything that's unfair for one side and the other is going to obstruct, uh, obstruct um, peace. I think that is a, a sort of given. Um, but I think you know, human rights has, has to be the fore here, and everybody has to have sort of equal say in determination of what the solution is. And I think in this case, it's, it isn't equal. I think the speed with which uh, territory is being occupied uh, can only mitigate against Israel in the long run. It's aggressive, it's, it's, it's uh, anti-social in the extreme, and can only, can only uh, antagonize, antagonize. I think what Israel should do is immediately stop um, their, their settlement policies. And I also think that they should apologize for the settlements they have built on a Palestinian land. I think that is one major thing that stands in the way of a peace pro progress that can go on and of a possible future recognition of a Palestinian state. Um, it's a really difficult situation. Like, uh, uh, it's not easy to just answer that question straight away. I think the best thing to do is just to sit down on the round table and just discuss issues. Uh, like um, political people from both sides should just sit down and yeah, just discuss what can be done and what shouldn't be done. And I think that's the way forward. One would imagine that the continued expansion of the settlements coupled with anti-Palestinian policies would obstruct the peace process. We turn to our experts for an objective insight into whether that is actually the case. I think uh, uh, the oppression that is meted out to the uh, 2.5 million Palestinians in the West Bank and those in Jerusalem is unprecedented. Uh, uh, it, it, it is it, the latest, the, the, the newest form of apartheid uh, that we are witnessing today. And those who have lived under South African apartheid bear testimony to this. Reverend Desmond Tutu has visited the territory several times. And he and others you know, who ha have lived under South African apartheid said that what they experience, what they have witnessed rather in Palestine is by far worse than what South Africans experience in the darkest days uh, of apartheid rule. The Israelis taking over the Jordan Valley, we see the settlements expanding so that they control something like 40% of the West Bank. I think the international solidarity, an international solidarity movement has to be built to support the Palestinians in their fight for justice and that should include building a campaign that boycotts those goods that are produced in the settlement areas and boycotts those companies that profit from the occupation uh, and that needs to be built on a wide scale like it was in relation to South Africa where the international uh, solidarity movement uh, built a campaign of boycott against South Africa in order to condemn apartheid and play a role in overthrowing the unjust regime. In January 2014, Britain summoned the Israeli ambassador to discuss Tel Aviv's decision to expand the settlements. 
is this enough? What else should Britain be doing about Israel's actions? In January 2014, Britain summoned the Israeli ambassador because of Tel Aviv's decision to expand those settlements. Is this enough for what else should be done in regard to Israel's plans? Since the conflict is still happening, I think it's never enough, because if it was enough, the conflict wouldn't be still happening. But I think, in general, it's just a really, really complicated one, uh, because both parties can be defended. Uh, so I would say that other solutions must be uh, found, and that uh, since this conflict is always uh, ongoing, uh, there must be different answers and different solutions proposed, and maybe a jury should respond and find which solution is the best one and which fits. I don't know a lot about why Israel thinks they need to expand or what the rationale is behind that. But, you know, once again, it's the whole issue of if they keep on expanding, it's, you're taking, it's a land that's owned by other people. And so, I don't know. I think in the end it comes down to uh, who's got the bigger guns because as sad as it is, it seems like if, you're, if you would win, you can pretty much take what you want, which isn't right, but that is sort of the situation we're in right now, I think. I think it's a first step, but I also, also believe that it is, in the, um, it is a necessity for the international community to try at least to ban that type of uh, action by, by the Israeli government. And if that's not possible, they should at least condemn it which is, of course, not possible in the UN Security Council because of uh, America's uh, veto right. But I think that in, a, in an ideal world, that is what should be done. The last word goes to our experts. We invited them to share their expectations of what they think Britain should do about Israel's expansion of the settlements. I think the, the, the situation in Palestine has gone beyond this uh, right now. Uh, mere words will not reverse the damage done by the expansion of settlements. Uh, what is uh, clear is that uh, Europeans and uh, British citizens in particular, uh, their trade unions, their companies are beginning to see that uh, they cannot no longer wait on their governments to take action and hence the reason we find uh, th this growth, uh, uh, growing support for the uh, boycott, uh, divestment and sanctions against Israel. This is the direction you see uh, 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 European governments should, should take. They are dragging their feet, but they are coming reluctantly because of the pressure from companies, you know, that are, uh, that are pulling out their investments from Israeli uh, 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 factories and, and projects in, in, in Israel, as well as in the occupied territories. I think the British government should say to the European Union that Israel should be denied any special status which allows it to, uh, to trade favourably with, uh, with Europe. And I think on the international level, it should give concrete and practical support uh, to the Palestinian people in Gaza, in the West Bank and uh, in Jerusalem. But also we should remember the Palestinians inside uh, 48, inside Israel, who also are being discriminated against, and the Palestinian refugees in Syria, in Lebanon, in Jordan, and wherever they are, who have rights as well and have the right to return. And the British government has a responsibility to aid and assist them uh, by all means in order to achieve those objectives. For Britain to summon the Israeli ambassador about the continued expansion of illegal settlements is not enough. The British government needs to do much more to demonstrate its disapproval of Israeli government policy in Palestine. The West has long taken a strong stance in support of individuals and peoples who are suppressed and even treated as second-class citizens in their own land. For the sake of justice and consistency, now is not the time to remain silent, but the time to speak up about the occupied territories and on behalf of the people of Palestine.